अभी आया हूँ म्यूज़ियम नगाड़ा मलेशिया की है इसकी नियरेस्ट स्टेशन है म्यूज़ियम नगाड़ा एम आर आप आओगे तो डायरेक्ट स्टेशन से उतर के आपको ये जगह आना है एक बार उस रोड से एम स्टेशन म्यूज़ियम नगाड़ा आई वो नगाड़ा आई अपनी नमार पीछे उस रोड से एकदम लगे आज म्यूजियम नगाड़ा पार हेड टिकेट अपना पड़े फाइव रिंग इट मैंने अपना एट्टी फोर एट्टी फाइव एने का एज मानु तो मैं कैस भर अंदर जा रहे देख रहे क्या है क्या नहीं हेलो कम आप इंग्लिश गाइड भी ले सकते हो आप तो यहाँ पे है एक लेडी जो बता रहे आप लोग Malaysia, how it came about, and uh, gallery gives you the early history, the prehistoric uh, background. Now, in Malaysia, you probably know we have a lot of rainforest. So, uh, we walk through here. You can see that this is a uh, a setup. We couldn't fit the trees in because they're much taller than this. But just to give you an idea, sixty uh, percent of Malaysia's uh, Land mass is covered in rainforest. There are different types of rainforests: uh, lowland, highland, the taro carp, peat mangrove swamp, and 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 the such. And uh, the thing is, uh, it has been a very important source for the early inhabitants, uh, sources of food and even medicine. And today, uh, Malaysia's biodiversity is recognised uh, as a very important source. So they are looking into. Uh, research into the various plants and uh, you know um, which they can obtain uh, for medicinal purposes, and uh, that was also an important landmark for our trading patterns because traders would come here to get uh, jungle products, rattan, resin, wax, uh, and, and such. Um, of course, uh, there is a lot of development in Malaysia, as you can see in the cities. But we are still proud to say that we do have a lot of rainforest. Now, uh, at, at the moment, you may be familiar with the map that we see on the right. This is what Malaysia looks like. Malaysia comprises of West Malaysia Peninsula, and and then 530 kilometers away, we have the northern part of the island of Borneo. That's called East Malaysia, and. Uh, That is what we know today, and of course, we've got all the other Southeast Asian countries around us. However, 12,000 years ago, the map didn't look like that. What we see in this uh, in this shaded area is that the seabed was exposed. The sea level was 120 meters lower than what it is today. So, in, a, in other in other words, this whole area was a land mass. So humans and animals could travel freely. Yeah, you see, uh, and then of course, eighteen thousand years ago, we had global warming. The ice caps melted. The sea levels rose. In fact, they rose to three meters higher than what they are today. And then of course, all the uh, certain areas are covered, and we have our existing landforms emerging. So. Uh, Early period is very similar to elsewhere in the world. We go through the Paleolithic period, the Neolithic period, what we call the Stone Age. So initially, as uh, the sea levels rose, people had to move further inland, and they would uh, like to stay near rivers because they are a good source of uh, food. Food. Uh, apart from food, they also have uh, sources of stones. 
Now these stones, they use and shape them into tools. So this is the first uh, sort of early development. In the beginning, the tools, the, the stones were shaped on one side as a cutting edge. Later on, they became more refined. And uh, how we know for sure that this was uh, quite a big um, occupation in terms of uh, developing and improving the tools is that uh, Stone Tools Workshop, which was discovered, which uh, is believed to have dated 74,000 years ago. Now, 74,000 years ago, what happened was there was a massive volcanic explosion. This explosion created what we now know as Lake Toba in Indonesia. And uh, the whole area was covered, even from South India and Southeast Asia, was covered in nine meters of ash. The ash looks like this. Fine, very fine ash. This is a sample. Imagine nine meters covering it. Now, of course, if it's in the open, the rain will wash the ash away. However, this tomb workshop was found in caves. So they were elevated and they were uh, preserved, protected from uh, rain and such. So they found that they, in, in this state, what they found is it looks like this, the find. This is what they dug. And they actually found it, um, what they can see is like an anvil. And then they'll place a, the, the, the raw material, the stone, and then they would flake it. Flake means cutting off parts and sh uh, shaping it. And uh, as time went on, we got better at shaping the tools. So you can see that this is what we produce. And um, in the beginning, of course, man was a, what we call hunter-gatherer, just roaming around and, 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 and just uh, finding food sources without any real plan. However, as time went on, we decided to adopt more settled lifestyle and started growing crops. So you can see the tools become more refined and more similar to what we use nowadays for access to cut down trees and such or to hack the logs to make out uh, a, a canoe or something like that. So uh, as time went on, this is what happened. And uh, the other interesting thing is, uh, back there you can see, they also started to make clothes out of tree bark. So uh, the stone implements, you can see the grooves. And actually it's quite a sophisticated method. You can see the grooves are very refined actually. On this side you can see the grooves. And they beat the, the tree bark. Of course, you know tree bark is a very, very tough material. So they'd have to soak it. They soak it in, in uh, water as well as maybe even urine. And it soften and then they will also beat it. And then it will be soft enough and form a cloth like that. Which they will wear. So uh, because they decided to settle down and do some farming and, and rear some animals, you find that they would need uh, some vessels to keep the crops uh, contain water and and they discovered how to harness the power of fire Therefore early pottery started to emerge and interestingly enough You can see that even at an early age they start to distinguish their pottery by some form of decoration See this is mine. This is yours. Don't something mix it up. Unique. Uh -huh. That's something unique here yeah. And uh, they also started to wear jewellery. Along here you can see some examples. The other interesting thing that they like to do is what we do nowadays. We like to take pictures and put it on Instagram or Facebook. And they would record it in form of drawings. You can see uh, paintings or drawings on the walls of caves in particular. Of course on the walls it would be preserved anywhere else the, the weathering would affect it. And you can see some very dramatic stories that they would tell. And they would use, um, uh, in this case, a material which is derived from stone called hematite. It's got a reddish tinge to it. Or they would use charcoal. Charcoal is also a, a material which they use to, to sketch or to draw and they carve it in. So you can see some very interesting stories that they would tell. A lot of boats there, you can see human figures and the like. Over here, we have a, a mock-up of what it would have been like, say, 11,000 years ago. A lot of uh, people would live in caves. This is what the, the, the it would be like. You can see some examples of cave paintings on the walls. Yeah. So they kept themselves occupied recording their daily activities and such. Now over here, this replica 
is a very important one. The original is in Lengong Valley, which I'll, I'll tell you about uh, a bit more later. Uh, this is known as the Perak Man. Now, this is a very important finding because it's the first complete human skeleton found in Southeast Asia. And uh, Lengong Valley has become a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2012. They are working on it now too. And they will very soon they will open the museum and the visitor center. So Perak Man has gone back to his home base. Um, and uh, what's unique about Perak Man is that he lived a lot longer than people of that period. People usually live to around 25 years of age, around that. He lived until about 45 years. Now, uh, the other interesting thing about him was that he, after they analyzed the remains, he had curvature of the spine and he had a deformed uh, left arm. So he only had one good arm to survive with. So they think that he must have been quite a wise and someone who was uh, respected and he was taken care of very well. That's why he had such a long life. And he was buried with a variety of grave goods like um, um, some uh, animal remains which shows maybe some meat was there, shells, his personal too. So he was given a grand burial. So that's an interesting thing. Okay. Now I'm going to whiz you along. Hindu Prince Parameswara, whom I, whom I spoke of, his name was Parameswara. Um, he had uh, a lot of acumen. He knew how to establish good relationships with China and with Majapahit. And so he was able to have a very stable environment. He was also able to negotiate some kind of deal with the Orang Lao. These are sea people who helped to control piracy. So because of uh, all that, plus a very good uh, system of government, proper laws of the sea and such, uh, Malacca became very famous and uh, uh, also became not only the science trade, but also became an important center for the trading of Indian textiles. Now some of the ships that traveled to this area didn't make it. So they, 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 there were shipwrecks and these were retrieved from shipwrecks. You can see that most of them are Chinese uh, pottery and such. Now, uh, the second ruler of Malacca converted to Islam. When he did that, it actually gave a big impetus to Islam to spread. Now, Islam had come to uh, Malaysia much earlier, but because he was a high profile public figure and he also incorporated uh, elements of Islamic jurisprudence into the laws of Malacca and uh, he also encouraged uh, education and uh, spreading the word he kind of elevated the status of Islam so Islam spread throughout the region so this is uh, what I was saying about the Malay kingdoms Malay kingdoms did not only were not just confined to what we know as Malay spread throughout the whole southern Philippines and the whole of Indonesia. So that is what we call the Malay Kingdoms. Now, uh, were being uh, diminishing in numbers, they got a bit worried. So that's one thing. The other thing is also, there's some anti-colonialist colonialist feelings simply because some of the Malays were being influenced by events in the world. They saw independ independence in, say, India, in Africa, all these countries are getting independent, so they're thinking, why not us? Yeah, so these ideas started coming. Now the British, when they were here, they never did much in terms of developing a common education policy. So each group had their own education system. There's no national education system. The Chinese had theirs, the Indians had theirs, the Malays had theirs. Now the, for the Malays, very often it's very simple. Most of them were petty farmers and, and fishermen. So their kind of schooling, this is what we call a pondok school. Pondok is hut in Malay. So they'll just sit under a hut. Usually in the morning they'll help their parents with whatever work in the fields. In the afternoon they'll, they'll go to the school and there'll be someone giving them some kind of schooling but it's mainly religious education. Very simple. For the Indians, most of them in the rubber estates, they had simple estate schools and usually the education is at a very basic level. Now the British, they did set up some uh, institutions. One of them is teacher training college to train the Malay teachers. 
Now that actually became a hotbed for active nationalism. 